and she's recording. Nara Shindo. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. This is Carol, and we're here today with Sue Tom. She's calling in from South Korea. Oh, this feels a bit like Radio of the Air. <laughs> and Sue is going to be enthralling us today with downloadable audiobooks, one of my passions, as part of the session title on mobile learning. And I really would love Sue to introduce herself because she'll know herself better. <laughs> but just before we do that, I'll answer Shingo's question. All of the slides that you see right here are already in your room before you even come in. Isn't that magic? So let's move through to the slides again. Yes, we did. Here's our sponsor page once more and our page for putting your face in your time zone. So let's do that. And it'd be nice to see Thailand lighting up today. And if you grab one of the little smiley faces or use one of the tools, then Sue will be able to see where you are. Ah, uh, Shingo, you're not able to grab them because you're on oh, the whiteboard preferences. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I forgot to turn that on. My, my apologies. <laughs> now you can because we've given you whiteboard access. Excellent. Now we can see your shining lights. Beautiful. Well, while that's happening, so tell us a little about yourself before you launch into your presentation, please. Yeah, sorry, um, can you say that, ask that question again? Absolutely. Yes, we'd like to know a little bit more about you, where you're coming in from today specifically, and tell them about the snow. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm calling from Busan in South Korea. And usually Busan is quite a lot warmer than Seoul because it's down the south and we're by a very beautiful beach. It's the best in South Korea. And um, so we had a cold snap in the last couple of weeks. And um, so we had snow on the beach, which was very fun. And the kids just loved it. Um, but I am Australian. We have a house in, we call Queensland home. Um, but we, uh, my husband and I are international school teachers. So we've uh, moved around quite a bit. We spent 10 years in China and three years in Tanzania. This is our second year here in South Korea, which we love very much. It's, it's always good to come from a place like Tanzania and everything after that. Is, you appreciate everything <laughs> and never, never complain about anything ever again. Um, so uh, connectivity in Tanzania was a bit interesting. Uh, I'm a librarian and um, I'm currently doing my uh, master's, sorry, my doctorate, and I'm just going to slide, click on the next slide here, um, at the University of New England, and uh, I'm nearly finished my, collecting my data, and partway, probably about, well, more than halfway through writing the dissertation. Um, so I'm very interested in uh, understanding student perception, so I want to know what the students think of listening to downloadable audiobooks and how they think it affects their literacy. So we think that um, there's a lot of research about um, audiobooks, but it's quite interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but a lot of our research actually just relies on parents reading to children or adults reading to children, so it's nothing at all <laughs> like an audiobook. Um, I don't really mind how I get my stories. Um, I just need stories, like Philip Pullman said. Um, and I'm trying to, really my main aim as a librarian is to get kids, I'm an elementary librarian, so primary school librarian, um, and I want just kids to be absolutely addicted to stories in any format. So whatever a favour, whether that's reading it in a paper, paper version or reading on an iPad or ebook or listening to the story um, or reading a cartoon version um, or um, <laughs> watching the DVD uh, film version. Um, and I think that as long as we get our kids addicted to those sort of stories, um, does it really matter how they get their stories? And I wanted to see if that affected literacy. Um, 
Yeah, a bit like life <laughs> is one big story. Actually, we've just uh, I've just introduced the kids to the fantastic flying books of Morris Lethmore, uh, um, William Joyce, and he um, I used the iPad version, so we got the words to the story, and uh, he just had some very actually even about the ending of the story. <laughs> um, if you haven't watched that um, film, it is available on. Uh, YouTube at the moment in various places. I think it's one of the copyrighted things that disappear quite quickly though. But it's a 15 minute film uh, without any words at all and it won an Academy Award. Uh, but it, uh, one of his quotes was, everybody, um, everybody has a story, to, well everybody's story um, matters and um, so it even deals with um, the ending of the story and how we pass on our stories when we go. We pass on our stories to the next generation, um, which are also very, a very important thing. I'm old enough to remember these, and I just wanted to show that like audio books have been around for a very long time. Um, I think the technology now and the, inch, the the amount of devices that kids have available to them uh, makes it a, and how easy it is to download. Uh, files now, I think it's a very good time to investigate um, how can we use this technology um, to improve our students' literacy. Um, how many of you like, actually, I'm going to ask it, can you say, just put a no um, in the polling uh, option, if you don't like audiobooks? So I'm going to assume that most people coming to a session like this like audiobooks, but I'd love to hear if somebody doesn't like audiobooks. Let's see if I can see everybody here. Or actually, no, have, we, we have a green check for yes, or a red for no. <laughs> yeah, so let's do a green check for yes. Because um, I'm quite fascinated to talk to people who don't like them, but it's absolutely fine to not like them too. So. Okay, I think we might be preaching to the choir here. <laughs> So, which is fine, I'm not trying to sway people either way, but it is an interesting thing that not everybody, and as teachers we need to remember too, that not everybody, not every kid is going to say, oh, this is fantastic. Um, I've read to some of my classes, okay, and that's interesting about, I've never used them too, because we don't know what we don't know. So if we say to kids, oh, would you like to listen to the audio version of that? Um, they may say no um, because they've never tried them. And so what might entice you to try an audiobook? Um, as a librarian, um, I try to give kids exposure to different formats of story. So um, I might show a little video clip to help background knowledge or I might um, read a paper version of the book, I might read an e-book. Um, and I also like to give them a chance to um, listen to an audio book and see if they like it. Um, so some of them get quite fidgety when I play an audio book because there's nothing to see or there's nothing to feel and they can't understand that. Actually we had a storyteller in Tanzania and they, so many of the kids just said, but what book are you reading out of? <laughs> and he said, well that's all, the stories are all in my head. You know, so he had no, so he would act it out. Um, so that's the nice format to have stories in as well to expose kids to it. Um, yes, audiobooks can be used to support bad readers, um, but it also can be used to support very good readers too. So, um, and some bad readers, or not necessarily bad, but uh, reluctant readers, um, may like audiobooks, but they may not as well. Um, so, and listen to podcasts too, I agree that podcasts are just as important and I would love to include podcasts in my study of audiobooks actually, um, but it just, it would be just too big a um, range for a, a study, but um, we'd like to hear other people um, do some more research on it. Um, it's finding the time to listen to them, that's so interesting too, that when do we find the time? We often say that we're busy. Um, this is actually a picture of my son. Uh, he's playing a computer game at the same time as listening to Harry Potter. Um, and I found that the kids, 
you think that busy kids wouldn't have time to actually read um, many books, uh, sorry, to listen to many books, but they do find time because they're often multitasking. And I had one student who um, would listen to an audio book and play Minecraft at the same time. And he would create the world that he was listening to in Minecraft, which I thought was just <laughs> astounding. I thought it was a great idea. Um, and driving and traveling um, is very uh, common use of um, audiobooks. Um, my kids travel, our whole family travels a lot. So uh, it actually, the reason that I got interested in this topic is that my kids would rather listen to stories than listen to music. And um, uh, that might not necessarily be uh, normal because most kids are usually exposed to music. But they listen to, on these little iPod shuffles, they'll listen to stories while we're waiting in um, captain's lines, when we're waiting at a shop, when um, we're, uh, you're traveling on the road. I'd rather them do that than look at a screen, actually, because I'd still like them to look out the window and see where we are even if they're <laughs> far away in the story. Um, and it's interesting about kids, you said you haven't considered them, um, because many students haven't considered them either. And I, yeah, we're talking about the attention, <laughs> uh, difficult to pay attention. Um, so I think as a librarian and perhaps as teachers too, if we give kids an option to see uh, what is available and what do they like and what fits in with their life. Now, for multitasking, multitasking is not for everybody. Um, so some people do complain that listening to a story is very distracting, that they can't do other things. Whereas I can actually shop and listen to a story at the same time <laughs> and do my house cleaning and, um, and especially when I'm traveling and I'm just sitting there, not necessarily. Or quite often we're plugged in or our kids are plugged in too because we want to be, it's merely a way of escape to be by ourselves in a group and you'll see kids like that and we think, oh, that's antisocial behavior. But um, perhaps I'm actually quite interested in the introvert-extrovert idea and quite often you do need that time away from everybody else, even though you're in a group, um, you do enter your own little world when you've got your headphones in. And I actually think a lot of, when I worked at a public library in Australia, um, the audiobooks were very popular for seniors, and there was a high proportion of seniors in the Sunshine Coast. Um, and they really liked, it keeps them company. And this is where I found with um, the students as well, I've got one girl who's very extroverted, but when she's by herself, she loves to hear um, other people, like she loves to hear the human voice. Um, so even when she is by herself, it keeps her company. Well, I think reading books keeps us company too. Um, yes, yeah, staying awake, very soporific to listen to an audio book <laughs> while sunbathing, yeah. Um, actually, I found that, well, for me too, but also um, the students in the study uh, listen to it before they go to sleep at night. So the parents get them to turn off the light. They can't keep going on the screen, but um, the parents will let them listen to an audio book with their eyes closed. Um, so it is very annoying when you actually fall asleep and you're in this <laughs> you wonder where you're up to. Um, and about driving and uh, if you've got a long straight road, um, it's um, very nice to have a story going on. And I think it, it actually can be a community or a family event as well. I've, we've listened to a lot of stories in the car together as a family and now our, our conversation has got, <laughs> uh, it's peppered with little um, ideas from the many different stories that we've listened to. Um, and yes, I agree, the students on a school bus twice a day. Actually, this is what I was um, mainly very, very interested in. And, and Keith, I'm sorry, I don't agree with the male's monotask. <laughs> um, there's a lot of discussion about that. Um, I, I'm very uh, monotask when it comes to some things too. But no, um, my, it, my son, actually, he thinks he really likes driving games and he, um, thinks that he drives better on his touch screen uh, when he's listening to an audio book than when he's not. So we haven't tried it in the go-kart though, he's a very keen go-karter. Um, 
and multitasking now, presenting this webinar and listening to the text. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, I'm actually not also cleaning the hands at the same time. Um, there is, so I tried to find out, I thought surely there must be a lot of research about audiobooks and how um, they affect literacy. And for example, books like this, this is audiobooks supporting literacy. And I don't want to um, discourage this book or the authors or anything like that, but I hear it and you read it so much in educational journals that there is a great deal of research. There's just so much, a broad range of research about audiobooks. Uh, but unfortunately, we, they just isn't. And when, I, when you look into it closely, the research is very dubious. It's um, anecdotal records of somebody liking audiobooks and giving it to their child. And, or it's about parents reading to children who are beginner readers. So I am studying uh, pre-adolescent children. That's actually action research. So I'm uh, making audiobooks available at my school where they weren't previously um, available. And this is the school that I work at. And um, that we've got students from 40 different nationalities in our 500 uh, student body. Um, so it's a fairly small school with an incredibly broad range of students with different accents. Um, we all, English is the language of instruction, um, but most of the students are bi or trilingual, uh, quite functionally uh, bi or trilingual or more. And um, I've just chosen students that are fluent English speakers and don't have any learning problems, learning difficulties at all. Um, that they've been identified anyway, and um, I wanted to find out what they, after extensive listening to audio books, what have they, uh, what do they think it helps them with regarding literacy. I'm just going to um, talk about, I'm just going to have a quick check, sorry I've been talking too much and I wanted to check the chat. Um, yeah, an audio book could be a relationship, so I can a lot of that. <laughs> Um, uh, very good. And um, I really like the whole uh, the family sharing, but also it's quite interesting um, seeing what kids recommend to other kids. Um, I've found a lot of students uh, who have got into audio books because they've seen somebody else listening. Now um, the multi sorry the um, Listen to your own device. I'm particularly interested in downloadable audiobooks um, because then, well, to say all of our kids have their, I mean, all of our kids have their own device at school. We're very uh, affluent uh, at school, but um, they appreciate that their peers don't necessarily know that they're either listening to music or listening to an audiobook, um, and actually. Uh, Shambhu Guru, I've just got to the, your question about, um, is it a question of learning styles? Um, the professor uh, who's written a book called Willingham, Daniel T. Willingham, I actually have this book right next to me, um, he actually has a lot to say about learning styles and that they are just learning preferences. Um, I don't want to get off topic too much here, but that has come up in my uh, research as well because a lot of uh, articles are about, oh, if your kids are audio learners, then try audio books if they're visual. But the research actually shows that we can learn, um, we do quite well on all modes of learning, but we're a bit lazy and we find one that we prefer. So, and we keep using it because it works for us. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only mode that we can learn through. So Willingham has a lot to say about, actually I'll write his name down here if you're interested in that, um, Daniel T. Willingham. Um, he um, is trying to encourage teachers to use a variety of modes in teaching rather than uh, try and say, oh, that child needs uh, tactile learning. I think maybe we all need tactile learning <laughs> um, uh, and we need variety rather than just get stuck in one mode, because we can actually learn an awful lot um, by trying different modes. Um, I, somebody wanted to dance and do computing. She said, does she want to do? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, okay, a uh, favorite photo of my son, and they're all listening to their own device. It's so interesting. Um, yep, I completely understand. <laughs> I think we so often are all connected to our own devices. Actually, I was very interested, sorry to get off the chat here, but, um, but I was quite interested in the iPads for uh, uh, preschoolers, Gail, Gail Lovely. Because I kept wanting to ask her, like, how much time should we all be spending on our devices? Um, I'm quite amused at some of the recommendations that they say, like, how much screen time a day a child should use, uh, be exposed to. Um, because when kids are travelling to and from school, they're using their devices, they're listening to stories, they might be playing their uh, touch screen game or their iPad game or whatever. Um, and people have said to me, like, yes, some of the kids can be so addicted to audio books that um, perhaps they're not, <laughs> never actually talking to anybody. Um, but it's the same with reading books too, um, that we, I mean, you talk about kids that are bookworms and walk around the school um, with their head in a book and not talking to anybody. I mean, it needs to be, obviously needs to be a balance, but just some, some kids are very addicted to audio books. Um, I'm trying to figure out, but I think they go in stages actually. Um, they'll be quite addicted to a series like Harry Potter and they want to listen to every single story and they might want to listen to the stories quite a few times each actually. Um, yeah, <laughs> headphones in <and> different colours. <laughs> um, and actually that's what um, uh, Gail Lovely was saying, uh, make sure your iPads are all different colours covers. <laughs> that was a really good tip. Um, so we can identify the different kids that um, are listening. Um, so the findings that I've found, uh, what I've found so far from the students is that they learn, when they're listening to, extensive listening to audiobooks, which are defined as uh, half an hour a day for more than half of the school year. Um, <clears throat> so it is quite, I mean, which you can easily do, so with just listening to the Harry Potter series. Um, they Again, their understanding of vocabulary in context. So all of them have said that they learn new words through audiobooks. So they're hearing how, how it's pronounced, but also the word meaning. Um, they'll often remember particular words, um, and they'll either ask an adult who's close by, or they'll just keep it in their mind. For example, one boy said, I, I didn't know the word din. So there's much more formal language, obviously, in, uh, in audio book, it's less frequent, um, lower frequency words. Um, and yes, I'll talk about um, making your own audio book, audio book experiences. One of the things with audio books, and I've only used professionally narrated audio books and not free books and not narrated by a teacher, because the quality of the narration is extremely important to these students. So they're very, very picky about Accents, and actually, I was just going to—I'll talk about that um, next about English accents. Um, they listen to stories repeatedly, um, which I'm saying can encourage critical listening because they really know if an author's made a mistake after you've listened to it three times. I say, um, but he swept his hair off the, off his forehead. But it, a minute ago, they said he was bald. So really, um, critiquing the story um, flow. Um, I don't know what else to call um, this literary omnivore. Uh, it's not quite the right term, but many of the students don't care how they get their stories. They like audiobooks just as much as they like reading paper books, just as much as they like reading ebooks. And it depends. They like, they like ebooks when they're traveling because then you can carry less, and our kids travel a lot. So they travel internationally, or, or the students from an international school. And um, they like paper versions of the books if they're at home. They really like the feel of them. Or if they start a series in paper, they want to finish it in paper. Um, or if they uh, have started the series in uh, by audiobook, they need the same narrator through every book. Um, I know that uh, Cornelia Funk's um, uh, in cart, we found that there was a different narrator for the second book, and I <laughs> And we were not happy. <laughs> so it needs to, it's like a connection with the characters. They like really long stories. They like to be with those characters for a long time. They get to know them. 
Um, now, the most, the thing I really wanted to talk about here is verbal fluency. They, what I didn't expect and have only found out from the kids that I studied is that they believe that listening to audiobooks has helped them in their verbal fluency. So they don't use, I'm just going to go to the next slide, they don't use filler words as much in their speaking, in their public speaking. Um, or, and actually, I hate, I hate talking about this because I can see how many times I use um and like myself, and I still listen to a lot of audio books, but uh, they found that it's very helpful uh, for fluent speaking in public. And I just found that extraordinarily interesting. I actually had one participant last year who was an incredibly good public speaker, and a teacher came to me and said, oh, she's, she's listened to audiobooks her whole life because her mother introduced her to audiobooks when she was very young, and uh, she, the, the teacher assumed that she spoke well because she's always listened to audiobooks. And I just found that fascinating that the teacher had assumed that. Now, is there any research about that? No, <laughs> not at all. So, I mean, I'm only touching on it. I'm trying to just find the student perceptions, but it would be a very uh, interesting thing. And yes, Carol, I can see from Toastmaster meetings. Um, but most of the students really do use all these filler words when they're talking. Uh, so it is quite extraordinary to talk to the students, the participants, or other ones, other students I have, who do listen to extensive audiobooks, uh, extensively listen to audiobooks, their pronunciation, their verbal fluency is just quite a step above other kids. Um, they also really appreciate different English accents. So I have all the participants, which was just um, by chance, uh, the participants are bilingual or trilingual. So their accent, they prefer, they either prefer a British accent or an American accent, and some of them have quite strong preferences for either or, but it does depend. They have to listen to a sample before they say, yes, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll give that a try. Um, and Project for Research into Audiobooks, Kickstarter funding, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Um, very good idea. I'm not sure if I'm very good at um, getting funding for anything, actually. Um, so, actually, it, I keep putting pictures of my son in here, but I just want to show that there is time, and I'll let some other people talk too, but there is um, time in a busy kid, kid schedule to listen to audiobooks if that's their preference and if, there is, if it's available to them. And I think that's where as a librarian, I'm finding it very difficult to provide uh, downloadable audio books to students, which is very frustrating. I don't know if other people, I'm going to give other people a chance here. Um, if, don't sure, so those of you who are teachers, can you put a tick, actually we just need to clear the polling, but um, can you put a tick if you, um, I uh, do have audio books available through your school library, or do you know if, if it's promoted in your school or somehow provided by the school, I guess is what I'm trying to find out, although I'm not sure everybody is working in a school. Uh, Japanese teacher, yeah. I'm just looking at some of your profiles. I think I've been talking to yeah, you. Maybe Shindo, are you able to use your microphone? Can you answer that question for Sue? Okay, <laughs> I didn't realise that. <laughs> oh, okay. Just yeah, fine. <laughs> we like everybody coming on. Um, with um, actually a very well kept secret, I'm also thinking that it's the poor cousin to ebooks as well. But the technology is the same. Um, you can download an ebook just as easy as you can download an audio book. The trouble is, um, so last year 
uh, actually last calendar year, so before Christmas, there was a fantastic, the BBC audiobook um, uh, vendor called Audio Go. It was absolutely fantastic. They had really good prices, very good. Uh, they had a whole lot of Doctor Who stories, actually, too. But they had a fantastic range of audiobooks in MP3 format. So it was completely unrestricted. And you could, I got permission to buy them personally and then share them in the school because they had so, they had no restrictions on their audiobook files at all. That you could probably tell what I'm about to say, but they went broke. <laughs> so, I, like, was their business model too flexible? I don't know. But it, as a librarian, trying to find flexible, well-priced audiobooks and ebooks, for that matter, to be able to lend in a school is very difficult. However, personally, I can buy them through Audible, Downpour, um, the, the, and various other places too, but they're probably the best choice. Um, and for very reasonable prices now, um, iTunes is still a bit too expensive, I think. You can get the same things on Audible um, for a much cheaper price. Um, Audible, I just actually, for anybody who's very keen at, on audiobooks, I bought 24 books. Um, for less than $10 each, I had to buy them all at the same time, but there is a very hidden uh, member option that you can get uh, each of your books for less than $10 if you buy 24 credits that have to be used within a year. So I don't work for Audible, um, but I do try to find the cheapest audio books around that have very good um, professionally narrated books. You can get many audio books for free on Gutenberg, etc., various places. However, a lot of them are really, I don't know, for very um, discerning users, like kids are usually, um, it's just not good enough. They really need it captivating. They need a very good uh, narrator that doesn't, it doesn't sound patronizing and uh, really feels like they're living the story. Um, and it's a nice voice to listen to for a long time. The text-to-speech as well, um, for the same reason that it's not attractive necessarily, although I know more e-books are providing really good narration, uh, human narration. And uh, for example, I was just looking, uh, showing some kids um, tumble books, which we have a subscription to. However, you do need to be like that. It's reading it to you while you're looking at the book at the same time, and that's not what I'm studying. Um, but it does actually have quite good narration for some of the um, books that are available. But then it's streaming audio, so you have to be connected to the internet the whole time. Um, so that's why I'm really looking uh, at downloadable, so you can be just listening to the audio, and I'm not looking at all at the interactive storybook uh, format. Um, some people said um, that like, the interactive storybooks are going to replace uh, everything because they're so interactive and they've got pictures and sounds and words and uh, movements and things. But I've actually found that sometimes we don't want to look. We, don't, we want to look out the window we don't, and we want to hear a story. We don't necessarily want to be reading and looking at the same time or we want to have our eyes closed while we're lying, lying in bed. So there's definitely a, a market for just hearing uh, the, the printed word. Um, you didn't, I don't use free audio books, but there are many good ones out there. Yes, they're a little hard to find, um, good ones. Uh, I'd love to know, and we're, we're evaluating here um, based on personal preference too. So what I think is a good audio book is not necessarily what somebody else will think is a good audio book. And certainly the same for kids. I'll listen to things that my kids might listen to and so for the students in the study. Um, we get audio books through our local library, yes. Now, and... Okay, um, for free, I also use the local libraries um, uh, in Australia. I can, I can connect to my local Sunshine Coast library. Um, I listen to a lot of them. Um, now, the public libraries 
have uh, usually have a subscription service to uh, Blender Audio or OneFit Digital or Overdrive. Um, it is actually very expensive and quite restrictive. I think the publishers are getting and the vendors are getting a lot of money um, uh, for their for each book. Um, it's not very flexible either. It depends. Like even if the audio book goes for half an hour, you have to borrow it for two weeks and it ties it up for uh, somebody else not being able to use it. And um, I'll have a look at your link to Shambles Guru. I think that would be interesting for me to look at. Um, uh, and criteria, yes, for purchasing audio books. Um, it's a very personal thing, and we need. That's what we like about downloadable books is that you can hear a sampling of it. Um, and before I buy any book for my family, the kids have to um, listen to a part of it and, and read the blurb and say, "Yep, okay, I like that." No, I don't like that voice. Um, actually, you cannot try before you buy from a retailer. Um, that's a real shame, and I think our requirements though are changing, we expect to be able to try it before we buy it. Um, so we really do want to hear it. And that's why I think, I mean, downloadable, if you've got a good internet connection, the downloadable audio books are just wonderful for that. You can listen to them in the car if you just plug it in. Um, you could be walking around the shop, still listening. I mean, it depends how keen you are. Um, so as EFL learners, um, I agree, audiobooks can be fantastic for pronunciation and accent. Um, it's a pity that we don't promote them more with um, EFL students. Um, quite often when they're just beginning to learn a language, um, we'll, we'll do that for them. But then when they keep practicing, um, uh, the ESL, um, are you asking a question, Carol, um, like ESL, EAL, English is a second language. Um, <laughs> That's and, I, it was related to uh, comments further back. I suspect that it's English as a foreign language as opposed to what we say here is English as a second language. And also reading, uh, actually there is some very interesting research about listening. Um, up until grade four, they found that your listening comprehension is greater than your reading comprehension. And about grade four to six, the reading and listening is very, very similar. And actually, that's the age group that I'm studying um, for that reason. I wanted to see if, if listening was preferable to reading. Um, they really, they're, they're, and these are all fluent readers as well. So they um, can read just as well as they listen um, to the um, standard of book. And, then the study found that from about grade seven up, your reading comprehension is greater than your listening comprehension if you haven't listened much to audiobooks. Uh, but generally, because we're so word um, focused in high school, uh, a lot of our reading is at a much higher level than anything that we are remote, like listening to if you're not listening to audiobooks. Uh, so if you're listening to television, um, movies, you're, you're listening to conversational level language, you're not listening to formal written language. Um, I'm just going to scroll down. Uh, and yeah, so for, just for younger kids, I think it has, it certainly has helped my children as they've grown up um, listening to audiobooks. And, uh, some kids like to listen and read along with the text at the same time. My children definitely don't. They've never liked that. They just like to listen or just like to read. Um, but I have found one of my participants prefers now to listen and read at the same time if he can because he says, I don't want to miss anything. And I thought, that is just fantastic. I love the enthusiasm as a boy, as a grade five boy. So I'm quite interested in the traditional reading slump that happens in about grade four or five, and how can we get some of the boys, particularly, that don't necessarily, they don't think they like reading. However, this one participant that um, came in very excitedly told me 
um, the other day that now that he has listened to some really long books, really long audio books, and he's read along with them, he feels much more confident to tackle uh, just reading rather than listening. And that was all his own doing. Um, but there's no stopping him now. So it seems that he he understands what amazing stories they are. So he doesn't want to miss out on them. Um, and I just, that, as a librarian, that completely warms my heart. <laughs> Um, and yes, if I was in palliative care, I would really need audiobooks. <laughs> I hope somebody, um, I hope I can communicate that uh, one day. Um, my daughter definitely likes to listen and read at the same time as well. Okay, so that's um, just superbly interesting, but then also just to realize that kids, there are many differences. So it's one of the, I, this is not, I don't make the kids listen, it's all voluntary, it's only what they want to, and, and sometimes they like to listen, sometimes the listening goes out of favour, sometimes they'd really rather read, or sometimes they can't find something that suits them at the time, maybe like, like a reading slump. Um, so it's very student driven, um, which is the most sustainable way to do anything, is if the students are completely <laughs> uh, enthusiastic about it themselves, um, there's no coercion. So, um, and then, yeah, she likes to catch words that she doesn't know how to read or um, at spell too. I'd just like to go back, sorry, I'm, I really do feel like I'm monopolising this whole thing, but um, I just wanted to point out the spelling challenges. Uh, we all agree, um, all the participants say, listening to audiobooks definitely doesn't help with spelling or punctuation. <laughs> so that's definitely a, a positive if you're reading along with the text. Um, that could possibly help. Um, but all the participants, even though they're reading, sorry, they're listening, um, they also read. So it's not that they're exclusively listening. Um, they're literary omnivores, I guess. Um, also, another thing that I didn't talk about was story ideas. Um, students that listen to a lot of audiobooks give the impression that they read a lot. Now, and the teachers will say, so I also, as part of the study, I'm uh, interviewing the teachers to find out what their impressions of the children's literacy development and comparing to the students' perceptions. And the teachers always say, oh, they're a good reader. They read a lot. Now, whatever read a lot means, but they give the impression, uh, well, they're going through a lot of text. They know, listening is often because it's a multitasking activity, they can listen on the bus, they do it in addition to reading. Um, they do get through an awful lot of stories quite quickly, or quite a few of them do. So then they can talk about the story that they've listened to as if they've read it. Um, and they often know it just as well as reading it. Um, so they can talk about it in depth. Um, okay, so understanding, uh, it may not be, the research, some of the audiobook publishing research shows that parents that listen to audiobooks usually have children that listen to audiobooks. So if you're, if Renee's um, friends, nine year old friends, don't know about audiobooks, um, they might not, I mean, yeah, they just haven't been exposed to it because of their parents or their school. Um, it would be interesting if she does talk to her friends about what she listens to. Um, because I know my son's friends have got, quite a few of them have got interest in audiobooks because he, they say, what are you listening to? And then they'll listen to something on a, on a bus trip together or something like that. And they'll say, oh, I want to try that. Um, so they're still young enough not to think that's too geeky. Um, there's strong market for leapfrog products, uh, read and listen, yes. Um, there is. Um, yeah, what I'm studying is quite different from that. So there has been some studies on the interactive storybook, um, and I'm not, I think that's just another market. Um, but just listening to formal language without any visual clues at all. Um, and yes, sorry, Keith um, can go. <laughs> I think I need to finish up very soon, actually. Um, are there any questions? I'd really like to hear from some other people. Um, yeah, that they don't know about audiobooks. And so some of them feel like um, 
it's a bit different in an international school. The kids are here, and it's a small school too. Um, they're quite accepting of differences, which is very nice, very refreshing. Um, so they're not embarrassed to talk about the fact that they're not. Oh, I'm not listening to music. I'm listening to a story. Um, they do tell each other, but then a couple of the participants have said that because they're listening on their own iPad, iPhone, whatever device, um, the kids don't know if they're listening to music or um, a story, and then they're not like nobody will even bother them because they just assume that they're listening to music. Um, but yeah, maybe, I mean, I'm doing it from the point of view of a librarian, but I believe it's my job to make sure that kids know about audio books, but um, to make sure that those kids do have access to them. Um, is there any questions or anything or any ideas that other people have? And podcasts, subscribe to your iTunes. I've actually found quite a lot of teachers listening to podcasts. Um, I don't... I haven't heard a lot of kids doing that, except if their parents do in the car. Um, but the, children, the students, well, I'm mean, looking at pre-adolescent students, they are very keen on uh, so the fantasy. Fantasy stories are very, very popular as audio books. Um, and yes, um, podcasts being very valuable, powerful learning resources, and to be used in the class to... I actually met one t English teacher who uh, gets the kids to, instead of doing the round robin reading, which we all know is not very effective, um, he actually gets the, but he wants to practice, he wants the kids to practice uh, speaking um, and recording themselves and speaking fluently. So he gets them as homework to read a section of the text and then he'll play it in class and then he'll randomly play it. So the kids have got to try and guess who the person is that's reading it. But then they, if they make a mistake, they can just re-record themselves. So that it's not as embarrassing as reading in front of your peers, especially for teenagers. Um, but yes, um, I would really like to, I think we do need to, there needs to be a lot more research about podcasts. Um, I think it's been a neglected area as well. But any other... Any other thoughts or questions or anything? And if so, um, so I'll just go to the last page here. Um, I just love that um, research is the door to tomorrow. I think we can't do enough research in education, and um, we also um, don't. We assume a lot of things in education, and we hear that other people have said there's research, and sometimes we're not critical enough to go and find out if there is actually research. Uh, we assume there is, but sometimes there just, just isn't, and it's the case with audiobooks. Um, making their own audiobooks, I agree, too. Um, it's the same as making their own e-books. They're incredibly proud of it. Um, I think it would be, it could be put on a, if they wrote their own book, and then, or wrote their own story, and then uh, did a recording of it, then you could publish it onto the, the, the wider web, which I think they would really enjoy that. Um, as for reading other books, I guess a few copyright issues there. Um, yeah, much less tech, and I really believe that so often, I mean, this uh, Blackboard Collaborate software is actually a case in point here. You're not seeing any visual, I mean, you're seeing a slide, but you're not seeing me or it's just my voice, um, so maybe our kids also need to learn to do this, um, to present globally um, and to practice reading aloud, um, doing it in front of your class and around Robin style is not necessarily the most entertaining for everybody in <laughs> class, you can actually kill a good story, um, unless they're a good reader. But yeah, maybe we need to... We need to think about audio more than we do in education. So I think I should probably wrap it up. Sure, I was just looking. Yeah, look, just before you do that, I was really intrigued with some of the comments that uh, Shambles has put down there. I love that last one about the school newsletters being an audio version. 
That would be really, really powerful. It really would, wouldn't it? All right. Yeah, I'll let you wrap up now. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, once again, you've given me lots of... Um, Yes, I completely agree. Round robin reading intimidating for introverts and they're struggling to read. And it's also incredibly annoying for everybody listening if they're not a very good reader too. It can. Uh, my poor daughter said, like, it used to be a good book until I've heard some of the kids in my class read it, but she didn't, <laughs> didn't like that at all. Um, yes, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, yeah, exactly. We should do round that room. I completely agree. Brown Superman, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you very much. Um, I love the comments in this um, form of presentation. I, I learn a lot from the comments, so thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. I love my audio book, so thank you for taking me on this little journey. I'll get you to just turn your mic off now to avoid the feedback. Thank you. And uh, I want to say thank you for making the journey to your room online from South Korea today. It uh, worked beautifully. Just click your talk button again to turn it off. That's it. Beautiful. And uh, just to remind you that um, as you exit from the room, you'll get a little survey to give your impressions of this or feedback on this session, if you wouldn't mind doing that. <laughs> And, of course, you can grab one of our Aussie Live badges, which have been fantastically created by our own Shambles Guru. Thank you for joining us today, Renee. Uh, that was um, interesting when I realised that it wasn't really Shingo. <laughs> so thank you to everyone, and I'm now going to close the recording.